I think there's this idea that in order to do good with your money or your financial power, that you have to be wealthy already. And I really wanted to dispel that myth with the book too, because sure, there are some examples where you can do a little bit more if you have more resources. But often if you just opt out of something, you say, no, I'm not going to move out of the starter home or no, I'm not going to move into the fancy apartment. I'm not going to get a new car when my existing car works just fine. All of that is anti-consumerist and good for your own bank balance, investment balance, whatever it is. You're listening to Yo Quiero Dinero, a personal finance podcast for the modern Latina. I'm your host, Janice Torres Rodriguez, personal finance expert, speaker, writer, and business coach. I teach women of color how to build wealth and gain financial independence through side hustles and investing. On this show, we're serving up POC-friendly personal finance knowledge, always with a side of sass. We're talking about how to make dinero, how to keep it, and how to make it grow. If you're ready to become poderosa with your dinero, you've come to the right place. Before we hop into today's conversation, I want to remind you to follow us on social. If you're loving this podcast and you want more community, you want to find out more about our events and all the stuff that we have going on behind the scenes, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and everywhere else you love to hang out on the internet. If you're loving this podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review if you listen to us on Apple. It's the easiest way to share our podcast with people that you know and love, and it helps us get discovered by amazing listeners like you. So take a moment, leave us a review, share us with your friends and family, subscribe so that you never miss an episode, and make sure to check out our blog, YoQuieroDineroPodcast.com, where you can sign up for our email list and you'll never miss an episode. Plus, you get exclusive invitations to our live events, special discounts for our digital courses, and as always, our best personal finance tips and advice to help you be poderosa with your dinero. Thanks for listening. Now, let's get into the episode. Tanya, welcome to the podcast. So excited to have you here. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thanks for asking me to chat. Absolutely. So as an avid subscriber to the FIRE movement, it's just such an honor to come into contact with folks who are at the forefront of this movement. And so you are definitely someone that I consider like one of the fairy godmothers, if you will, of the movement. So I hope that you take that with honor because you have had a big influence on not just myself, but a lot of, especially like women who have subscribed now to this idea that maybe the whole narrative that we've been told about going to school and working for four. 40 something years and waiting to retire with a pension and social security might not be the thing that we all need to do. So thank you for your work in that space. It's really appreciated. Oh, thank you for saying that. It's funny because now anytime someone says fire movement and addresses a question to me, I immediately bristle because I think that there are so many, let's just say it, toxic voices in that space and folks who equate it with all the wrong things and use it really just to sell a lot of products that aren't vetted and are of unknown quality. And so that's all stuff that I don't want to represent. But yeah, in terms of helping more people see themselves as having the ability to not work till, I mean, let's be honest, it's not even 65, it's like 70, 72, 73, 75 for a lot of folks. I want it to not just be like white male tech bros who get that opportunity. (laughs) Yeah, that would be nice if it becomes a more inclusive space. So yeah, thank you for giving women permission to also have part of this conversation because for a long time, it just felt like, oh, if you're not like a white dude who works in Silicon Valley and wants to assist on rice and beans for 10 years so you can make millions of dollars in the meantime, this is not for us. And so I want to find out first off, how did you come upon the fire movement? What was your introduction? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I came upon it after my husband, Mark, and I were already on the path. So I know everyone's always like, oh, there was this Mr. Money mustache post or this or that. And like, (laughs) for me, it was very much inspired by a childhood experience that I had and continued to have for many years, which is I watched my dad get forced to retire early at the age of 42 because he has a disability that I now share, although it looks a bit different in me, but he was actually fired, laid off sort of in a gray area there by his company that he'd been with for a really long time the day before the Americans with Disabilities Act took effect so that they wouldn't have to accommodate him. And I saw how much he struggled with that. 
And then I learned through that process how terrible the disability safety nets are for people. You know, if you become disabled and are forced to stop working, what's available? We were really fortunate in that he had a long-term disability insurance plan at work. So we had a little bit of supplemental income, but life really changed a lot for us once he couldn't work anymore. And so having seen all that, I said, I don't want to go through that. And this is genetics. There's a very good chance I'll get it. And got into my late 20s, kind of went, okay, I need to get my finances together. And maybe I need to be thinking about how I cannot work forever because I don't want to be forced out. I want to be able to leave on my own terms. And there's the fun side of it too, which is like, I want to be able to travel and do some things while I'm still able-bodied enough to do them. In the US, I think as imperfect as disability infrastructure is, it's still a whole lot better than in most of the world. And the thought of like trying to travel somewhere in a wheelchair, it becomes a lot harder when you leave the country because, you know, there aren't wheelchair ramps, even like in Japan, which is very modern. When we were there, we were shocked that there weren't ramps in the main train station and things like that. So wanting to travel, wanting to not get forced out of work, those were all very much my motivation. And so my husband and Mark and I had already put together kind of a loose plan of how do we get there before we discovered the FIRE movement, which was a lot smaller in those days when I first joined. But then it was sort of nice validation of like, okay, we had all these ideas and now we've discovered this concept and all these other folks think it'll work too. So that just sort of gave us a little bit of extra oomph. But it was something we kind of came to on our own. And I think that that's pretty common, actually. I've heard from quite a lot of readers who've found my blog or found Work Optional, my first book, and have said, wow, you helped me realize that I'm actually almost there or you helped me realize I can retire now. I had no idea. So I think my experience wasn't actually rare or special in any way. Yeah. I love that you mentioned this overarching theme of not necessarily choosing fire. Like It needed to happen if you were going to live the most fulfilled, expressed version of your life. And I think what a lot of people tend to see is just the glamorous side of it, right? Like, yeah, I want to fire my boss. I want to be retired by 30. I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 40. And it's just like, once you get there, there has to be some other reason why you're doing this. Mm Because watching Netflix and traveling around the world, it'll probably get boring after a while. So (laughs) do you think that, that enough people think about like what life after fire looks like and maybe some advice that you took into account when you were thinking about that? Yeah, I think that most people don't, although I will say, I think there's a big gender divide on this. This is definitely a hashtag not all men, but I do think that a lot of men in the fire movement sort of just talk about like, oh, I'll have this life of leisure. I think women who I've met have tended to be more intentional and have said, okay, I recognize that I'm going to lose this big chunk of my identity and what am I going to do to replace that? Or if I bring it up, at least I found women much more receptive to that conversation. But yeah, I think you have to think about like, what are you going to do with your days every day? It's traveling. I don't think it ever gets boring, but I think at a certain point, you probably go like, what does this all add up to? Or what's the meaning in my life? What value am I adding to the world? What purpose am I contributing? And I think it's important to think about those questions, purpose especially, to think like, when you look back at your life from the end of it, what do you want to look back on? What do you want to know that you contributed? There's a reason why my book, Work Optional, we don't actually start with money stuff. We talk with life questions. We start with the legacy stuff. And what do you want to be remembered for? What are issues in your community or in the larger world that you want to be a part of? of addressing. Because I think it's actually looking at what that life that you want to transition into looks like that guides the financial plan. Everybody gives this bad advice, which is like, you're going to spend less in retirement. I don't know who these people are who spend less in retirement on purpose. Of course, plenty of people do because they have no choice because their retirement income is limited. But I think if you have a choice, most people, like you have a lot of hours in the day to surf on Amazon or to be (laughs) in non-pandemic times booking travel. And it's very easy to spend a lot more money in retirement. But if you have a sense of what you want to do, then you sort of have a better guide of how much to save. But yeah, I think looking at what you think you might actually want to do to fill your days or to add up to something purposeful is important, but then also leaving some flexibility because one thing that I think is just kind of hard to anticipate, maybe impossible, is that a lot of the stuff that you love to do now that might bring you a lot of joy, it starts to get really boring once it's not 
a counterpoint to stressful work. You know, <laughs> once the stressful work stuff goes away, the things that you actually find joy in might shift a lot or your family dynamics or household dynamics or friend dynamics might change and things that you think you're going to want to do while others are at work, no one's going to want to do with you. And so it's important to leave some of that stuff open-ended. But I think if you go in with no real plan, that's really a recipe for unhappiness. And I've seen quite a few people retire early and become depressed or get divorced or all these things that I'm not going to say every marriage should stay together by any means. Certainly some divorces are very, very good things for people. But I think a lot of that too can be sort of failure to look ahead and to do the introspection that you have to do to figure out what you actually need to get out of life to make it fulfilling. Yeah, that's a really great point. So I think what I've seen is that a lot of the motivation from some folks can come from just the fact that they hate their job so much and they want that escape. But then it's just like, that's not going to sustain you once you've accomplished what you wanted to do. And I think it just requires more reflection on the why. Like there has to be some greater purpose. And I think this is a great segue into the whole concept of building wealth. It's not just about a number or it shouldn't just be about a number because money can be such a powerful tool for you to make real change from a macro and a micro level. And so that was, I think, part of the inspiration for your new book, Wallet Activism, which I'd love to dive into because this idea of using money to change the world, that's something that I talk about a lot. But I think a lot of people, they just have a hard time wrapping their head around like what that actually looks like from a practical standpoint. So can you talk a little bit about what your inspiration was for the book? And then we'll dive into some things that people can do to become wallet activists. Yeah, you're going to hear my voice uh, light up now because I'm so excited to talk about wallet activism. I think for me, the inspiration to write the book was that I wanted the book to exist. I wanted to read the book. You know, I think like a lot of folks, I felt really concerned about, okay, where are the dollars I'm investing going? Not in a sense of like what stock is it buying? Because I know that, but like then whose pocket is it going into when it leaves my bank account. The money that's sitting in my bank, what is that funding? Money that I'm spending at the grocery store, what's that funding? It was sort of like all of these financial questions that I think a lot of us ask. But to your point, a lot of folks feel really overwhelmed with the question. And I believe very strongly that that is on purpose, that there are tons and tons of corporate forces, marketing forces, in some cases, government forces who want us to feel powerless as individuals. Because if we recognize that we are powerful, then we are going to start to do things differently and ask more questions and push for changes. And so I think it behooves most corporate folks for us to go, oh, wow, I'm just one person. I can't make a difference. I see this all the time on social and it drives me crazy every time. I see this, some variation of the meme that's like 100 companies in the world contribute 70% of global climate emissions. So what am I trying to do recycling my plastic bottles? Like, well, okay, fair point. But also, you shouldn't be buying the plastic bottles in the first place. <laughs> That's, we can actually meaningfully cut the demand for plastic as consumers. It's some version of sort of like, oh, these big corporate actors do all this bad stuff. So I have no culpability as an individual. And I just think that's wrong. I think we need to surround our problems from all sides. We need to hold corporations accountable. We need to push for policy action. But we also need to recognize that as individual consumers, we are the economy. We fund all of these companies, all these things that are happening that we don't like. We are the ones giving them that money to make it happen. And so we can withhold that. And what I really want people to understand and part of what really encouraged me to write the book in a world that, frankly, I think we all relate to this, feels really bleak a lot of the time. It's sort of like, well, isn't it too late? I don't think it's too late. And I think that if you're going to complain about capitalism, which is totally fair to critique it, but capitalism actually gives us a really amazing opportunity, which is like under electoral change, voting, we have to get past 50% to get somebody elected. And then usually you have to get public support more like 60, 70% to get any meaningful policy action to happen. But with money and corporate profits, if you can hurt corporate profits by 3%, 4%, 5%, if you can make a bank lose 3 4% of its customers, they are going to sit up and pay attention. Their shareholders at the meetings are going to go, what is happening? Why are we hemorrhaging profits from a relatively small percent? And that gives us an enormous opportunity to make change. It's just how are we able to be smart about that? So it's not just like 
we're all going out and doing things through good intentions, but how do we actually have an impact? And that's really what the book is out about. Sorry, that's such a long answer, but you can tell I'm really passionate about this. <laughs> no, and I love the topic because honestly, it's not something that's talked about. There's this such an American characteristic for us to just focus on the accumulation without the purpose. And then we find ourselves very often completely unsatisfied with achieving all of these quote unquote marks of success that we should be thrilled about achieving, whether that is, you know, buying the biggest house, buying the most expensive car, da, 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 having a whatever net worth. But it's just like, okay, but why are you doing this? Have you done that personal introspection to identify how your spending correlates with your values? And I don't think enough of us do. So how do we start identifying how we can value our money and then use it as a force for good. Yeah, I think first it starts with recognizing that your financial power is not just about shopping. I think that's how the conversation has tended to be led that, well, okay, ethical consumerism or conscious consumerism is what you should be practicing. But both of those are still fundamentally consumerism and say that the point of everything is to consume. And we can question that premise and say, nope, I reject that idea. Maybe some of the time the right answer is not to consume, which, by the way, is good for the planet. It's good for the workers who would otherwise be exploited to give you all these things that we love to buy cheaply. But it's also good for your own money. And I think there's this idea that in order to do good with your money or your financial power, that you have to be wealthy already. And I really wanted to dispel that myth with the book, too, because Sure, there are some examples where you can do a little bit more if you have more resources, but often if you just opt out of something, you say, no, I'm not going to move out of the starter home or no, I'm not going to move into the fancy apartment. I'm not going to get a new car when my existing car works just fine. All of that is anti-consumerist and good for your own bank balance, investment balance, whatever it is. So I love this analogy that I use all the time about if you're a vegetarian and someone says to you, do you want a burger? You do not burn any mental bandwidth. You don't burn any willpower. Considering that question, you just go, nope, I don't do that. I don't eat burgers. Or maybe you go, okay, well, do you have like an impossible burger? <laughs> Whatever you enjoy. But it's not something that then like you have to dedicate any space to figuring out. And so it's the same with figuring out your financial values. If you know, okay, well, I don't support things that rely on exploitation which unfortunately, it's really hard to avoid exploitation entirely, but you can do your best. Or if you want to say, I focus on reducing the racial wealth gap above all things, then you might be someone who's making an effort to shop in small businesses owned by people of color in your community or doing other things that address that versus if you're someone who's primary concern is the climate crisis, you might be trying to consume as little as possible and really looking at the environmental impact of everything you're buying, which is going to lead you down a very different path than someone who's looking more at the wealth gap. So those things are meant to try to automate this because my goal isn't for you to like feel overwhelmed all the time by all the information and the complexity of your choices. It's to feel like, okay, it's a little bit of a learning curve at first, but then once you get some of those choices newly wired in, then this isn't exhausting you every day because that's not sustainable. We can't go through life creating a lot of change if we're feeling totally overwhelmed all the time. And I know the world is already doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned the overwhelm part because as someone like myself who is educating a community of primarily first generation investors that I'm just trying to help folks wrap their heads around like what the hell is an index fund. So mm -hmm. now it's like, do I throw on this social responsibility that we now have on top of it to be good, morally conscious investors? I feel like so much information for a beginner can be paralyzing. And then it's just like, you know what? This is too complicated. I'm not even going to do anything. So how do we balance that? When it comes to investments specifically, the honest truth is I think that we have put way too much emphasis on responsible investing because it's much less impactful than it's talked about. And I think that a lot of that is because the messaging is driven by people who are trying to sell these so-called responsible investments. So I think for talking to folks about investing, I think the good news is whether you're really going after responsible investments or not, it's not going to make that much of a difference. However, we can be talking about things like banking and responsible banking, and that has the potential to have an enormous impact. And that's something that you don't have to learn about. You know, I think people fundamentally understand banks more or less. You know, you have 
checking account, savings account, maybe a money market account, maybe your mortgage is through there if you own a home, but it's much simpler and more accessible. But if you help people understand that, hey, if you bank with a big bank, one of the big corporate banks that has branches all over the place, the money sitting in your savings account is most likely going out to fund new fossil fuel projects that drive climate change, or it's funding the building of new factories that rely on exploited labor or new mines to mine conflict minerals, all kinds of things that I'm sure most people don't want their money going to fund. And if you move your money out of that bank and into a credit union, yeah, it's a pain. It's a pain one time to move your bank. You've got to move some of your deposits and maybe move your paycheck and that kind of stuff. And not saying that that's fun, but the good thing is you do it once and then it's done forever. And then you know that your money is going, it's staying in your community. It's funding things like mortgages and small business loans, not big evil corporate stuff. And I think that kind of shift in the financial education, financial literacy space is much easier to make than trying to send people down a path of, okay, we just talked about index funds, but now we have to get into much more complicated investments. I would say focus on banking, focus on spending, focus on how you earn a living. All of that stuff is potentially much more impactful than the investment side. I wrote a column in Market Watch a couple of months ago about why ESG, environmental social governance, sort of the buzzword for so-called responsible investments, really isn't all it's cracked up to be. So if you're interested, you can go check that out. I give a bit more explanation on that, which is not to say those who are doing responsible investments should stop, but it's good to know the whole context so you can look at what else you can do. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Are there good and bad resources to do this research, right? Because there's so much information on the internet and I'm very wary of like rabbit holes we can go down with conspiracy theories about this company or that product or whatever. So how do we start doing those internal gut checks and maybe some research into where we're buying, what companies we're working for, et cetera? There's no need to go into conspiracy land. I think it helps to just remind yourself, virtually everyone who's telling you anything ever is trying to make money. Uh, (laughs) Like That's just a simple fact of capitalism and profit motivation. If it's a person who's trying to like provide a service to feed their family and keep a roof over their head, I think you can generally feel pretty okay about that. You know, you don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. But as soon as you talk about a company that has a board of directors or has stock somewhere, then you know that there are really complicated motives involved. And so it's good to start asking bigger questions. And so, yeah, I give a ton of resources in the back in the appendix of wallet activism, but it depends on your interest. If you're really interested in like, where is a company giving its political contributions? There are good resources for that. If you're more interested in where are they sourcing their materials from and is it relying on conflict minerals? There are good tools for that. You can go quite far down a rabbit hole of trying to look at every little aspect. And unfortunately, the truth is you're probably not going to find very many things you can actually buy then. But again, that's where looking at your values, if you're focused on the wealth gap, you are going to do different research than someone who's focused on the climate crisis solely. And all of us are going to have a few different interests, of course. So it's about prioritizing some of that. Um, But there are, I just want to reassure everybody, there are really good tools and it sort of might feel like, okay, at first, I feel like I need to rely on a lot of these things, but then you know, okay, this company I feel okay about, this company I avoid, um, that's the hamburger, you know, I just don't eat it. And you can sort of build some of those things into your life. I really encourage folks to start small, start with one or two areas and then build from there rather than feeling like, oh my gosh, I have to overhaul my entire financial life. If you just switch where you're banking, that is a fantastic start and you've already done a lot, but be sure to tell the big bank why you're leaving on your way out. And then in terms of work, I think if you're working for an industry that you know is evil, you know, like let's say you're working for the tobacco industry, which I think we can agree has no really redeeming societal value. But if you are in a position where you don't have a choice about that and you have to work for them because it's the only good employer where you live, then maybe it's not about saying, okay, I refuse to work for you, but maybe it's about agitating from within for change or trying to promote more diversity, promoting more science-based reasoning. I think we see right now in the Great Resignation an enormous push toward unionization, which is all driven from low power workers from within. And so that might be something that you can do. And so all of it helps in some way. Or if you're an investor in a company, you can often push from that angle. So we have all these different ways that we are powerful that we don't recognize. And at work is very much one of them, even if you don't feel like a particularly powerful member of staff. Mm, I really love that. Yeah. I think it's just really about 
harnessing our own individual power and then not being silent. There's Mm -hmm. so much power in sharing with folks like what you're doing and why. That's how a lot of really amazing grassroots movements have been born. So share the wealth. (laughs) Totally. You have different forms of power. You have social capital. Mm -hmm. You have the capital of being able to harness the power of all your coworkers. We have power in so many different ways. And again, I think the powers that be, the establishment, don't want you to feel powerful. And so one of the best things you can do is reclaim that power. Say, no, you're lying to me. I am actually powerful. (laughs) You need me. You may be undervaluing my labor, but you need me or your whole business falls apart. And so let's remember that and use it. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we can use our money for good when it comes to our political government environment because it really feels, the word is beyond bleak at this point. It just honestly feels like a futile endeavor to try to change what's happening in this country. I think more of of us are seeing that like, it doesn't matter what side you're on. It's a shit show. So how do we use our money to actually start making change when there's so much gatekeeping with who is allowed to even like run for political office, who has the capital to run for office, who influences these elections? It can feel like what's the point? I hear you. It it was funny because when I was talking with my publisher about wallet activism, I said, I want the book to really tell people like this is because our leaders are failing us and that's why we need this. And they wanted to soften it a little, which was probably fair. (laughs) I spent my career in politics, so I believe in the power of political change. But I do agree that it is feeling bleak. And I think regardless of what side you're on, folks aren't doing enough. They aren't stepping up. They're focusing on the wrong thing. I do think that's part of why we need to focus on where companies' political contributions are going so we can try to cut off some of the funding sources for some of the worst folks in politics. But I think that we have to recognize that our power lies beyond just the ballot box where we may have power, and that's true, and I think everyone should use it and vote. But how we use our money in many cases, matters more and has a lot more impact on what the world will become. Use the example in introduction of the book of plastic water bottles. You know, when I was a kid, I'm 42 now, when I was young in the early 80s, there weren't plastic water bottles. That was not a thing. You could not buy bottled water unless it was like Perrier, which was not something my socioeconomic status of people did. (laughs) So, but you think about plastic water bottles, like, did you ever vote on whether there should be plastic water bottles? Like, no, of course you didn't. That was a decision driven by consumers who were pushed by marketing that told them that that water was better than the water coming out of your tap. And in some cases, like for communities who have had a lot of pollution and environmental injustice, that might be true. But in plenty of communities, like the water in the water bottles is just tap water and it's just the same as what you've got. So that I think is a good example to remember that like We created this situation where the oceans are full of plastic. We're pumping tons of oil out of the ground every day just to make new plastic water bottles that was never put to the vote. And so remembering that, we need to think about, okay, what is the demand that I'm creating? What am I signaling to the markets that we want more of through my actions and my purchases? And I think that's a good mindset shift to make to remember that, okay, every single time I buy something or exert my financial power in some way, I am sending a demand signal to the markets to say, more please. And so if we can avoid that, while also holding politicians accountable and pushing them harder, I think that's the recipe for change. That's what we need. And it might feel like we're shouting into the void at first, but that's how change always feels. Change always feels really bleak and dark and like nothing's happening until all of a sudden things happen very quickly. So I know some of that is about like keeping faith that things can change. But I think if you look around, there's so many of us who are so angry and unhappy with how things are going that it's not a leap to think that this is going to bubble over and become an urgency to change at some point very soon. So I think we got to keep that faith and remember that we have more power than we think. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a long-term game, y'all. That's what I'm hearing. Like it's not going to be solved tomorrow, but being Mm -hmm. aware and just being a more conscious human, I think can go so far. And I love how what you're talking about ties so much into why I believe that it's especially important for women to become financially independent and build wealth. Because I just feel like wealth in the hands of women will naturally be for the greater good. I think as women, we're just natural community builders. We are caretakers. We are just 
we're so much more conscious of the world around us versus men. That might be a little bit of a generalization, but I honestly do feel like when there is parity with wealth, as much in the hands of women as it is as in the hands of men, like the world will be a more equitable place because we just don't spend money the same way. We don't value money the same way. And I think we naturally gravitate towards creating a better society. Am I just too lofty in my ambitions for what I want for us? (laughs) No, I don't think you're too lofty at all. I mean, I do think there is ample evidence to suggest that when companies are led by women, they have better family-friendly policies. They tend to pay more. But I think we also can't, as women, let ourselves off the hook of having to do some of this work, which there is a known phenomenon that's been called the empathy gap, which says that as you earn more money and as you accumulate more wealth, you lose empathy for people who are at a different point in their financial life or just frankly live a very different life from you. And so I do think that we as women are susceptible to this and that that's been pretty well documented. So I think that we have to keep reminding ourselves of, okay, as I'm moving up, as I'm accumulating more, as I'm moving into a different social circle or, you know, whatever it looks like for you, that we remind ourselves to, you know, if you came from a lower income or lower wealth background, remembering where you came from. It might be if you came from a perfectly comfortable background, trying to push yourself to get out of that sometimes and to try to understand how other people make their decisions and get by because it's very easy to lose that empathy. And I think you sometimes see women in personal finance say things that feel really insensitive and feel like they're sort of blaming people for being poor, which let's be charitable and assume that's not their intent. Cultivating empathy is an ongoing lifelong process, and it's something that we as women have to do also. But that said, I do think that we are more naturally inclined to do that work because of how society socializes, but doesn't teach boys to have the same values. And of course, we're talking very binary right now, but like, I think society tends to still teach kids in a very binary way. And so boys are taught that their individual success is the best outcome and teaches girls that the team success is more important. And so let's use some of that stuff that's been drilled into our brains and and use it for good. But yeah, I think if you focus on empathy and you remember that we want to always be trying to redistribute power to those with the least of it, like the example I use in the book is saying we need more women CEOs. Yes, we do. Objectively, we do. There are very few in Fortune 500 companies or in big companies. But who are we actually helping and how is it helping more if we push for more women CEOs versus pushing to raise the minimum wage, which disproportionately affects women and affects the women with the least power versus the very privileged women who are potentially in line for CEO somewhere. So both are important, but I think we should prioritize the focus on minimum wage and the minimum wage earners. So it's sort of that thinking of just reminding ourselves of like, who has the least power? How can I be a part of shifting some power and resources to them? And if you can keep that front of mind as you move up the income ladder and the wealth ladder, then yeah, women are going to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I love maintaining that perspective. It reminds me of like when Jennifer Lopez said in her song, I'm still Jenny from the block. Like you have to remind yourself where you came from. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know right, if she's so still Jenny it- from the block, but... <laughs> Uh, I would argue she's probably not, but at one point it was believable. Um, It's a good sentiment. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So for folks that want to do like one thing in 2022 to start putting this into practice, what would your advice be? I think it's sort of looking for like your pain point. So we talked about banking. That could be a good one to switch. If you heard that earlier and went, oh yeah, I'm banking with... I won't call people out today, but um, it's all in the book, but I bank with a big bank. I'm going to move. Great. Perfect starting point. But thinking about your other pain points, if you know that you tend to buy a lot of stuff, a great place to start is just say, I'm going to only spend half as much this year on stuff as I did last year. That's both a great move for your own finances and your financial future and security, but it's also meaning that you can basically assume everything that you buy at a regular store that isn't artisan made or something like that was produced via exploitation. Unfortunately, even if it has a label that says made in the USA, because union workforce has reduced so, so much across the country, made in the USA doesn't mean what it used to. It doesn't mean that that person making it is able to put food on the table or keep a roof over their head. So just buying less is a perfect starting point. And then before you start adding things back, you can then be more intentional and say, okay, this category of thing that I used to buy 
how is it produced? Who makes it? Where do the profits from it go? What happens to it when it gets to the end of its life and it has to go to the landfill? Will it truly be recycled? Unfortunately, for most things, the answer is no. Stuff like that. You know, you can start to take those questions on one category at a time, which I think is much more manageable than trying to look at everything. So just buy less and you will be putting less of a burden on the planet and your fellow humans and your own finances. So it's really a win-win-win. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad you brought up that point about the made in USA thing, because as somebody who used to work in consumer goods manufacturing, like I've been to modern day sweatshops, because that's honestly the only thing I could equate it to that were located right here in the good old United States of America. And the exploitation that's happening in these places is on the same level as what you would think goes on in third world countries. So don't let yourself be fooled by really fancy labels and targeted marketing and celebrity endorsements, because there's so much more going on behind the scenes that you just don't know unless you're in, in those industries. Yeah, for sure. And I, I don't think any of us want to walk around thinking, I look good because I exploited other people. <laughs> and so it's just kind of reframing that in your mind and remembering that behind so much of our economy is exploitation. So how can we cut some of that out? Yeah. Tanya, this has been an amazing conversation. For folks that want to find out more about you, buy wallet activism, find out more about the work that you continue to do, where's the best place for us to find you? You can go to my blog, OurNextLife.com, and that has links to basically all the places. Wallet Activism is available in all the book spots. And for those who want to avoid the mega everything store, Amazon, you can always buy ebooks through IndieBound, through Bookshop.org. You can buy audiobooks through Libro.fm, which supports local bookstores. So I hear a lot of people say, well, okay, I know I could buy the hard copy of the book at my local indie, but what about the audiobook or the ebook? I have to buy those from Amazon. Not true. Very easy to avoid them. It just takes a little bit of relocating the websites you shop from. So yeah, you can get it wherever you want, but if you want to start using some wallet activism with the purchase, there are good other options. That's an amazing way to start. And we will definitely include those links in the episode show notes. Tanya, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for being here. Oh, this was a great conversation. I love chatting with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you are ready to take your dinero to the next level, sign up for our free 14 page guide, The Financially Lit Latina, the ultimate blueprint for becoming poderosa with your dinero. This 14-page guide includes our best tips on money mindset, budgeting, debt repayment, career, investing, financial independence, side hustles, and more. And you can get it completely free. So to get your copy of the Financially Lit Latina, just head over to YoQuieroDineroPodcast.com slash start. That's YoQuieroDineroPodcast.com slash start and start transforming your dinero story today. Until next time, stay empowered, stay inspired, and stay poderosa. On the Yo Quiero Dinero podcast and associated entities, all information provided is for general information purposes only and does not constitute accounting, legal, tax, or other professional advice. Listeners should not act upon the content or information found here without first seeking appropriate advice from an accountant, financial planner, lawyer, or other professional. We assume no responsibility for information contained on this podcast and associated entities and disclaim all liability with respect to such information, including but not limited to any liability for errors, inaccuracies, omissions or misleading or defamatory statements. Usage of this podcast and associated contents constitutes an explicit understanding and acceptance of the terms of this disclaimer.